Well, good morning, Trywell and friends. I know uh, this is a little bit weird. I've, I've actually never done this before. Recording uh, a message onto video is something that's new for me. Uh, it might be new for you guys in terms of watching me this way, but uh, welcome to my living room. And obviously we're not meeting this morning. Uh, and uh, so I'm coming to you from uh, my living room in Burlington and I hope you guys are comfortably uh, seated at home, maybe with a cup of coffee. If you got your Bibles around on your phone or uh, in your hands, you can stick uh, your finger into Colossians chapter 4. That's where we're going to end up this morning. Before we dive in, I want to share a few things. The first thing I want to do is I want to send a shout out to Dan, uh, our, our youth pastor, to all our youth leaders and, and our students. We're really disappointed and we're, our hearts are heavy for you because we know how much work and how much time has gone into preparing for our trips that we're supposed to go north to Mishkagogamang and south to Trinidad. Uh, and having to uh, have both of those trips canceled this week, we're, we're so disappointed and we're sorry uh, with you and on your behalf that those were the circumstances. Um, but uh, given everything that's going on culturally and even globally right now, uh, it's really the right decision and we want to let you know that we're working towards looking at having our trips not cancelled but rescheduled and as we have that information and as we make those decisions uh, we'll obviously keep you in the loop on that process so so Dan big shout out to you and to all the leaders who put so much time in and students all that work we just we're thinking about you and we look forward to when those trips will happen so that you guys can um, continue to to see the fruit of the work and the time you've already put in okay so we'll, we'll promise that for you um, I have never pastored a church through a pandemic, at least not like this one. Um, our staff have never pastored through a pandemic. Our elders have never eldered through a pandemic. And like everyone, we're sort of figuring this out as we go. And so we really appreciate your patience. We appreciate your support. Um, and we want to reiterate that, that canceling our services is not about fear. This is actually truly an attempt for us uh, to love our neighbors. Uh, we just all want to do our part as, as communities. Um, to mitigate the risk and uh, uh, particularly for those who are at great risk to the virus who um, and we know that that most people who get the virus will be completely fine within a few days but we do know that there are some um, for whom the consequences of, of getting sick might be quite a bit more severe and so it's really just out of sensitivity to that we don't want to cause harm and so we're just going to switch things up and do things a little differently right now I also want to say something that I've heard a few people say online and in different places in the last few days. Um, you know, what does it mean when we say God is in control? Um, is God in control? He's absolutely in control. God is sovereign over creation. He's the Lord of creation. Nothing escapes his notice. So is God in control? Yes. But God is not controlling. Uh, he's created all of us with the freedom to make choices. Uh, we can make good choices and we can make bad choices and one of the ways he's made us is to make those choices but it's also to live with the effects of our choices um, and so what does this mean it means as followers of Jesus we don't somehow get a free pass um, you know that somehow because you know we love Jesus and we know the Lord that that bad things aren't gonna happen to us uh, we can't live recklessly or dangerously with this ill-conceived idea that oh no it's it's okay God's in control nothing bad will happen that's actually kind of silly. In fact, many faithful followers of Jesus are going to get sick with the coronavirus, and some, and again, possibly even many, will die from the coronavirus around the world. Uh, and we grieve for those, those losses the way we would grieve for any uh, person who, who dies suddenly without warning. Um, but God's promise to us is not that bad things happen. When, when we talk about having faith instead of having fear, God's promise to us is that he will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, it's his strength in us, it's his presence in us that brings us hope and comfort and peace so that when we're going through difficult times, when we're going through periods of uncertainty, we don't have to feel terrified and afraid. We can be reminded that there is a God who sees everything, who's in control, uh, but not controlling. And in light of that, we try to make good choices to love him, to love our neighbor, um, and to, to participate in the hope and the peace and the comfort that the knowledge of God and his presence with us brings. And one of the great ways that God brings his presence, where he brings his comfort and strength, is by his Holy Spirit in us, uh, but also among us, as we are together uh, friends and family, um, and we encourage and, and support each other in those ways. So we're gonna push pause on Mark, at least this week, um, and we'll, you know, we'll determine how we roll out here uh, in the weeks ahead. 
Um, but I want to share a few thoughts this morning, um, sort of in light of our current context. Uh, I'm not going to do this, uh, I'm not going to edit this, this is all in one take, just the same way you'd get on a Sunday morning, so if I stumble and mess up my words, it's just like a normal Sunday. And for some of you, I know you like to sleep about 10 minutes in, please go right ahead, you're in the safety and security of your own home, I won't even see this week, so go ahead. But if you got your Bibles, uh, I want to share a couple thoughts, and so let's look at Colossians chapter 4. I want to read a few verses uh, to us as a family, and just spend a few moments looking at what we can take out of this. Um, let's read... And actually, before that, let me give you a quick background on Colossians. If you're having trouble finding Colossians right now, it's really easy to find. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company. It's one of the ways to remember it. Or Gentiles Eat Pork Chops, whichever your favorite acronym is. But uh, Colossians is at the end of those four. Um, but the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Christian church in the small town of Colossae. And he probably wrote it around 60 or 62 AD while he was in prison in Rome. So if you read the end of Acts chapter 27 and 28... That's probably the time that Paul wrote these words. Uh, and it was about the same time he wrote Ephesians and the book of Philemon. And all these letters were sent with Tychius and Onesimus to the churches in, in the area. And they have, sort of all have the same theme. And the theme is that Christ is, is, is Lord over creation. He's redeemed his people and he enables us to participate in his death, in his resurrection, and then the new life of his kingdom. Uh, and he's giving us encouragement and instructions on how we can do that. And so he's writing to the church in Colossae. And uh, we come towards the end of the letter in chapter 4. And I want to read this to you. This is what Paul writes to the believers in Colossae. He says, Devote yourselves, he's starting at verse 2, uh, chapter 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So Paul gives us some, some neat insights here. He makes it clear here uh, explicitly in Colossians, but he also makes it implicit in a lot of the other letters that he writes in the New Testament that when it comes to the mission of God's people and participating in this life of the kingdom, that there's, this, there's these two streams that we work on as believers. And, and at Chartwell, we've talked about it, or I've talked about it before, as these, these dual prongs of proclamation and demonstration when it comes to the kingdom. On one hand, Paul talks about, and he operates with the belief that there are certain people within God's family, uh, the church, who are gifted in sharing the gospel, in, in talking about the message of Jesus and the kingdom, uh, and there are certain people in the church that are really gifted at that. We call them, you know, evangelists or people with the gift of evangelism. Uh, and there's no question that Paul sees himself in that category. He sees himself as someone who, whose primary, one of his primary tasks is to preach and proclaim the gospel. Um, and there are evangelists who travel like Paul did. There are evangelists who are rooted in a congregation or a community. And for that, we can look at examples in the Bible like Timothy, who was connected to the church in Ephesus. Uh, they're gifted specifically with the ability to proclaim and speak the gospel of Jesus. And, and, and this gift is a spiritual gift. What's really cool about it is when these people use that gift, uh, almost always the people to whom they're speaking and sharing respond really positively to the gospel and to the mes message of Jesus. That's what makes it a spiritual gift. It's when our ability comes together and combines with the power of the Spirit to accomplish something more than we'd accomplish on our own. And people with the gift of evangelism see that happen when they talk about Jesus when they talk about the kingdom, the people they're speaking to are always open and, and receive the message well, almost all the time. And so it's a really specific gift. And it's true in the time that Paul lived, and it's true for us now, even as a church family at Chartwell, that there are people among us who have that gift. And there's, there's three things that Paul said we need to do, and it's revealed in his request for prayer. First, he says we need to pray for those people among us who have that gift, that they would have opportunities to use it that they'd be in the right places at the right times with the right people to, to talk about the hope of Jesus and the life he wants to invite us into. So we need to pray that people will have that opportunity. Then Paul says that when those opportunities come up, that the people with those gifts will have boldness, uh, that they'll seize those opportunities with confidence. And then thirdly, he says that when they do take those opportunities, that what they share will uh, be shared with clarity, you know, so that if we are going to share truth about Jesus, that we're doing those things in really clear and understandable ways and so for some of us at Chartwell and within the, the body of Christ at, at large, these are things we need to be encouraging. 
But Paul doesn't assume that everyone in the church has that gift. He doesn't assume that all of us are, um, are evangelists uh, and are just going to spontaneously, effectively share the gospel. Even though we need to be prepared to do that, not all of us have that gift. But Paul doesn't necessarily um, stop there. He, he actually goes on to say, this is what I want you to do. He says, I want you to be wise in the way you treat people who aren't part of the church. He says, I want you to make the most of opportunities to show love to them. I want you to make sure your conversations are full of grace. I want you to know how to answer them. So here's the point. I, I don't think Paul believes we're all evangelists uh, called to boldly proclaim the gospel. There are some with that gift who are intended to use it both locally and around the world. But for most of us, we don't have that gift, but it doesn't mean we're off the hook. I think Paul thinks that the primary way most of us are expected to engage with the world around us is through kind and gentle acts of presence, of care, of compassion, and of grace. Um, so if you have the gift of evangelism, we want to pray for you and encourage that in you, that you'll have lots of opportunities. But for the rest of us, what we want to pursue is opportunities to be present, opportunities to be gentle, to be compassionate, to be loving, to answer people's questions in conversation, to talk about our own lives and our own experience of faith gently and wisely in ways that open doors. And so that's Paul's, that's Paul's prayer for, uh, for the church in Colossians chapter 4, um, verse 5. He says, be wise in the way you act towards people outside the community of faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So at a time like this, uh, where there is uncertainty uh, socially and in our communities and, and in our workplaces and our schools and in our, in, our, you know, in our neighborhoods, there's an opportunity for us as followers of Jesus to be present, to be caring, to be compassionate, to speak wisely, to speak gently, words of reassurance. Let me give you um, another thought along the same lines, and I'm going to flip ahead to Titus, uh, Titus chapter 2. Here's another hint if you're looking through your Bible for um, Titus. All the T's in the New Testament are together. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. All the T's are grouped together, so they're easy to find. But listen to what Paul writes now to Titus in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. These are his instructions to Titus. He says, You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach servants to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Now, there's lots of cultural stuff in there back in the first century, some context there. Timothy was lead, or sorry, Titus was leading in a church on the island of Crete. Crete was not a really well-respected place, and Crete had, in fact, brought a bit of a reputation upon itself as as not necessarily being uh, the best uh, examples of moral and upright behavior. In fact, if you're aware of the the saying, "Oh, that person's a Cretan," well, this is where it comes from. The idea of the people who lived in Crete in the time of of Titus and Paul. They, they weren't necessarily the great models of upright citizens that maybe we would aspire to be. Um, but Paul's writing to Titus here for inst with instructions for the church about how they can live um, in that context. Uh, and specifically, he's giving guidance and instructions to older men, older women, and how that translates for younger men, younger women, for husbands, for servants, and, and all kind of all the, the social structure and fabric of, of where Titus finds himself. And he runs through this long list of things, you know, um, old men to be temperate and worthy of respect and self-controlled and sound in faith and love, and older women reverent in the way they live, not addicted to too much wine. I, you know, I'm tempted to make jokes about some people I know who are watching out there right now, but I won't. Um, 
uh, but to teach what is good and then train the younger women to how they how to be you know good wives and good mothers and and how the younger husbands and how younger men should also do the same to be self-controlled and all these things and it almost sounds like is Paul giving out a whole lot of more rules here is he giving a lot of laws like what's the deal I thought I thought we lived with grace well here's what I think Paul is doing because he explains it actually really clearly in verse 10 he says to them he says do all these things so that in every way we will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive um, he says if you live this way if you live differently than the people around you he says that's gonna make the teaching of Jesus attractive to people they're gonna see that there's something ah, maybe a little bit different We're not better not more right not judgmental not self-righteous but to live in such a way that curries and builds favor and a good impression with others maybe because we're not living the way everybody else does he says older men don't be intemperate or disrespectful or unloving why because the other older men in Crete were not living that way they were they they were they were being inappropriate they were living without self-control so Paul is saying to the to the older men in the church be temperate be respectful because no one else is so have this opportunity and take this opportunity to be different he says to the older women he says don't slander your husbands or drink too much wine why because on Crete, that's what all the older women did. So Paul is saying to Titus, teach them to be different. Young men, he said, be self-controlled. Why? Because no young men on the island of Crete were being self-controlled. Uh, husbands, treat your wives with honor. Why? Because Cretan husbands were not treating their wives with honor. In fact, it was so common in that culture in that day that they would have three women. In the, within the Roman Empire, it was very common for, for men to have three women. They had their wife who produced children, they had their mistress for sensual indulgence, and then they had a woman who they would take for social outings, who were like trophy wives. I mean, it was, a, it was an incredibly dysfunctional setting. And Paul is saying, look, guys, don't be like that. Honor your wives. Everyone is operating this way. You have this chance to be different, so, so be different. And then he says to servants, he says, don't steal from your masters. Why? Well, because all the servants stole from their masters. Paul says, in the setting you find yourself in, Take the opportunity to live differently. Don't just live like everyone else around us. So what does that mean for the church? What does that mean for us here in the GTA during a pandemic? What does it look like for the followers of Jesus to take opportunities to be different? Not better, not more right, not self-righteous, but how can we take steps to stand out so that the message of Jesus and his hope and presence in our lives is attractive to others? Here's some simple ones to start with. Um, don't hoard toilet paper. Have you seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Have you ever seen that? Did you study that back in school? You know, the basic needs we have are for food and for shelter and, and that kind of stuff. I think this week has demonstrated that we need to add a, a section below that picture that apparently the most important and pressing need we have in humanity is for bathroom tissue. Um, so one great way we can immediately break the trend is let's not be hoarders. Uh, that seems to be what a lot of other people are doing. So what a great way to be different. Hey, why don't we share what we have? Why don't we share what we have? Because we're not people of fear, we're people of faith. And, and this is a real easy one. Christians are always intended to be known as people who are open-handed and generous, not hoarding. So there's a great way we can start. Let's not hoard stuff. Um, let's not resell hand sanitizer. Uh, again, we don't need to do that. We don't need to be people who are opportunists. But you know what? If you go online right now, you can like you can YouTube all sorts of ways that you can actually make homemade hand sanitizer. Why don't you make a whole bunch of it, put it in jars, and take it to the people on your street and say, hey, from, from your friends down the street, on us. Um, this is an opportunity for us to show kindness and generosity to the people around us, not just the people in our church, but to the people in the world around us. We're all in this together. It's in our own best interest to care for one another. So what a great way, what a great opportunity to do that. Uh, another thing we can do, let's make sure we're checking in on each other. Maybe we need to check in on our neighbors, people on our streets who we know are a little bit older. Maybe for them, getting out to the stores is difficult. Uh, let's, be, let's be loving towards uh, one another. Are there people we know on our streets, in our, in our workplaces, or, or you know, in our church that would really benefit from someone who would run some errands for them, um, um, help them with something around the house? These are ways we can just be present. There's lots of opportunities for us to do it. And a little goes a long way. Let's be other-centered. Let's be thinking about others. Why? So that the life of the kingdom of Jesus in us is attractive to others. 
because it brings healing. It, it cultivates community. These are all the things that we are going to be needing and reaching for in these times when there is uncertainty, where there is some people who are afraid. Let's show a different way. Let's show a better way. Invite some people over for dinner. Maybe someone you don't know as well or someone you're just getting to know or someone you've known for 30 years. We haven't canceled life. We, we've just canceled temporarily some large group gatherings uh, to mitigate risk, but that doesn't mean we still can't get together and be encouraged in one another's presence. You know, if you feel sick, take the right steps to make sure that you, you know that you're not gonna be making anyone else at risk. But you know, if you're, if, if, you're not, if you're not sick, there's still lots of opportunity to get together, to be friends and family, and uh, to make the most of the opportunities that we have, to show love and compassion and presence to one another. Uh, here's one, how about we turn off our screens? I know you think you want to, we all want to stay up to date on the news and all of that, but you know what? There's not a lot going on right now. The theaters are closed, sporting events are canceled. I mean, there's not even any hockey on TV. I don't know about you, but I just freed up a few hours in my week. Um, what if we just like turned away from the screens and we turned towards the people close to us? This is a great opportunity for us to spend time with each other. Schools are closed. Universities are closed. Families, we're going to be together. We're going to have opportunities to be together. We're going to have opportunities to help look after each other's kids who are home from school. There's to me, tons of opportunity for us to have some really good face time together, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, why don't we maximize it? Um, you know, play a game together. Here's, here's a good one. Totally appropriate uh, for the season. Uh, play a game. When's the last time you did that as a family? I'm not a big fan of games, but I see more games in my future this week. So why don't you play a game together? Have some good conversation. Um, one of the best nights our family ever had in Malawi, um, and, and we're not a perfect family by any means. Sometimes our family is a dumpster fire. I'll, I'll be really honest with you. But one of the greatest things we did while we were in Malawi, we had a music appreciation night just as a family, just the four of us. And everyone came together that evening with two songs that we really loved. And everyone got to play their songs and we all listened. And then we each had the opportunity to share why we loved this song and what was really special about it to each of us. What, ha have a music appreciation night in your family. Uh, and, and don't roll your eyes at the songs, you know, uh, your, your family members play, but listen and appreciate and listen to why it's important to them. That's just one idea. Um, read out loud to each other, share some stories, read an article that you find interesting and then talk about it. Um, read a Bible story to your kids if you haven't before. There's lots of ways we can just really simply really practically spend some quality time with each other and we can actually leverage what might appear to be socially uh, a really terrible thing into an opportunity where some some really simple memorable stuff grows uh, it's not rocket science and I'm sure you guys have a hundred ideas I haven't even thought about but as we are moving through these days uh, where there is uncertainty you know we don't know if we're gonna gather for church next week we know that lots of activities are being canceled let's look for the opportunities to be present with people Let's look for the opportunities to be kind and compassionate and gracious to one another. Let's not be people of fear. Let's be people of faith because we know that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. That doesn't mean that no bad things ever happen. It means when the bad things happen, we have the peace and the hope and the confidence to go through it because we're not alone. We got the spirit with us and in us and we've got the presence of the spirit among us as brothers and sisters. And that should bring tremendous comfort and hope to us. But let's make the most of every opportunity to be present, to be compassionate, to be gentle and kind and wise. And as we have opportunity for people, uh, uh, with people to talk about the reasons why we're not panicking, why we're not hoarding toilet paper, uh, we can share wisely what we believe about the, the goodness and presence of God in difficult times. And uh, let's make that life of the kingdom attractive to people just in the simple ways we can demonstrate the love of Jesus to others. Let's think about the people that no one else is thinking about. Let's reach out to them with a phone call, an email, make sure that they know that they're being thought about and cared about. And who knows, we might look back on this three, four, five weeks from now and say, wow, we saw God do amazing things, things that we wouldn't have believed except that they happened under these circumstances that we took the most advantage of to be the hands and feet and the presence of Jesus wherever we go. So thanks for listening this morning. I know this is a little bit strange. I, I hope this doesn't become something I have to do for too much longer because frankly, it feels a little weird, but I'm glad you tuned in. I'm glad that you guys took the opportunity 
to watch and let's remember to pray for one another. And as information comes out in the next few weeks, we'll just try to keep you guys posted on what, what we're doing as a church family. So check the Facebook page, check our website, uh, chartwellchurch.com, and uh, we'll try to keep you guys up to date with info as it unrolls. So thanks for being with us today. Bless you guys. Love you. I hope today uh, is a surprisingly awesome day in ways that you didn't even expect or imagine. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.